Dear students, in today's class, I want to equip you with the techniques that we use in microbiology that will help you understand what's going on in your environmental samples and environmental situations. Now, these techniques are um, that I'm going to cover in this class and the lecture after this class will be the techniques that are used across the globe and also including the techniques that are um, that have recently emerged as high throughput cost effective and yet sophisticated in sense that they require special specialized skill set. So, we will be covering a wide range of techniques uh, ranging from the older but better established techniques to the newer and more promising ones and I will be going through the basic uh, in environmental laboratory setup to give you an idea of what it is like and what uh, to work in an environmental microbiology lab and what are the precautions that we need to take care of. Alrighty, so let's start techniques in environmental microbiology. Okay, so in the last class I told you, I reminded you about the basic paradigm of microbiology which is DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. RNA is a messenger, protein is your actor. So now I want to understand what the genomic signature is, what the RNAs are, what RNAs have been recently transcribed and what proteins have been translated. So in order to get information about these, I definitely need to extract the nucleic acids including DNA, RNA or the proteins separately and then analyze them, sequence them in case of nucleic acids and characterize them in case of proteins. I might also look at the metabolites which are affected by the protein activity and get metabolomic information. Now how do I go about this? It is very um, I interesting and easy to know in theory, but how do we do it in practice? So let us together explore the key microbiological methods and bioremediations. Now the two pictures here, the on the left panel you have a cell. Uh, culture and you can notice that there are um, colonies of different morphologies, different colors. They are different sizes. So the bigger ones perhaps are the faster growing colonies, the smaller one are slowing, slow growing ones and then the different color perhaps hint to different kinds of microbes, different species and strains of microbes growing in this plate. On the right we have an outdated technology called DGGE. I call it outdated because we have um, cost effective, time effective and easy to do sequencing techniques now which make this DGGE quite obsolete. But it has been a gold standard for quite some time until recent past actually, I guess until 2011 when this was phased out. So let us explore these techniques. The first question is now you know your environmental problem. For example, let us say excess of chromium in groundwater and you want to find out the microbes that would sequester the chromium from groundwater. Now the step to find out the right microbe, how do you do it? Well, we have something called Vinogradsky column which is basically a column that allows the water or your sediment in case of lake, in case of groundwater, your groundwater and sediment to um, form vertical gradient such that uh, on the top we have a foil, a stopper that stops things from falling in. And because uh, it is in communication with air as in the air can freely move in and out, on at the top we have higher oxygen concentration but as we go below we have lower oxygen concentration. Also notice that in all the three of these Vinogradsky column we have black material at the bottom. These are the sulphides. So as the oxygen gets depleted we move towards the anaerobic zone. So at the top we have an aerobic which resembles the top of the lake. So remember in lake we talked about in previous lectures how we have oxygen gradient, we have electron acceptor gradient, we have light gradient. So th all these gradients are assembled in these columns. Vinogradsky used these columns to uh, detect and to isolate different kinds of bacteria such as pur purple non-sulfur bacteria, purple sulfur bacteria and green sulfur bacteria. Alrighty, then so one option is to set up something like Vinogradsky column where you can simulate the environmental conditions and then with depth you have different microbial communities, right? Or the top you will have algae and cyanobacteria, then you will have purple non-sulfur bacteria, sulfur chemolithotrophs and then you will have patches of purple sulfur uh, or green sulfur bacteria and then here you will have sulfate reducing bacteria. So if you want sulfate reducing bacteria, sample them from the bottom, not from the top. You want algae, sample it from the top. The other option is to do enrichment culture. In enrichment culture, I take my microbes from environment and I enrich them on solid conditions. For example, I want microbes that are tolerant to arsenic. 
they don't they can live in very high concentration of arsenic so what i can do is i can take microbes that are already exposed to arsenic or you know just environmental microbes of interest and then i can put them in arsenic rich conditions and i can enrich them in sense that the microbes that are tolerant to arsenic they will grow they will flourish and rest of them won't now how do we enrich there are two basic methods of enriching one is sequential batch transfer so in sequential batch transfer i have a batch so oh by the way if you um, did a, Okay, let me go through briefly two different kinds of reactors, batch reactor and CSTR, so that you understand the chemostat and sequential, sequential batch reactor that we are going to talk about. So in environmental science and engineering, we talk about three different kinds of reactors which are very, very important. So let us briefly go through them so that we can understand the two different methods of enriching microbes of interest. Alrighty, so the first kind of reactor is called as batch reactor. Okay. The second kind of reactor, we can call it chemostat. The third kind of reactors, which is more relevant for actual environmental conditions is plug flow reactor. Alrighty. So let us try to briefly understand what these reactors are. For enriching, we use batch reactor and chemostat reactor. Chemostat comes under many different names. V the most popular one in environmental science is CSTR. So CSTR stands for continuously stirred tank reactor. So starting with batch reactor, it is more like your washing machine. So you have a reactor, you put things in. For example, in washing machine, we put our dirty clothes, we put the soap, we put the water and then you close it. So in step 1, you have put things in, in step 2, you have closed it. So in step 2, you have closed it and you allow the reaction to occur here. So your reaction is happening here. And once your reaction is over, you open it again in third step. You open this reactor again and you take your products out. So this kind of reactor is batch reactor. We put reactants in, we allow the reaction to happen. When reaction is complete, we take our products out. In continuously stirred tank reactor, it is a very different scenario. In continuously stirred tank reactor, our reactor looks very different. It will typically have a port for entry of reactants, continuous entry of reactants and another port for continuous exit of products. Already, so we have a in CS and then usually if it is chemostat or continuously stirred tank reactor it will go continuous, it will undergo continuous mixing. So the continuously the reactants are coming in, this is being mixed, so a constant concentration is being maintained inside the tank and then there is a continuous output, alrighty. So a good example for this would be a lake, there is continuously water coming in the lake and there is continuously water going out of the lake and we can assume that the lake is completely mixed, at least some lakes are completely mixed at any given time. So if for enriching microbes, we use the first two kinds of reactor, batch reactor and chemostat reactor. In batch reactor, what we will do is we will set up a batch reactor, we will put, let us say I want to uh, I enrich microbes that are tolerant to arsenic. So I will put media that is rich in arsenic. So my media is now rich in arsenic and I will put my environmental microbes here. So I, let us say I am interested in isolating arsenic tolerant microbes from cow dung. So I will put cow dung here. I will put arsenic rich media. So there is food and there is arsenic. I will give it the right temperature and other conditions that are required and then I will seal it. For some time I will let the microbes grow. Now because some microbes in the cow dung will not be resistant to arsenic, tolerant to arsenic, they will die off. 
and those populations that are resistant and tolerant of arsenic presence they will get enriched. So, their abundance will increase and the abundance of rest of them will decrease already. So, after some time what I will do is I will open the lid away. Now, I have a microbes that um, more microbes that are tolerant to arsenic and I will set another batch reactor. Again I will give it food that is rich in arsenic. And I will take the microbes here that are already partially enriched in arsenic tolerance and I will put them here. And then I will seal this off and let it sit for some time. Let the microbes grow using the food and again we are selecting for the ones that are arsenic tolerant or arsenic resistance. And we can repeat this as many times as we want and so on and so forth. Such kind of microbial enrichment is referred to as sequential batch transfer because sequentially we are transferring from one batch reactor to another to another to another until we have a population that is resilient when it comes to in face of arsenic presence which is arsenic tolerant or arsenic resistant. Um, this, this sequential batch transfer method can be slightly modified to go to diff to go for dilution to extinction method to characterize our microbial communities and even isolate our microbes that are of, of that have particular quality. The second way of enriching microbes uh, from environment that meet our requirements that meet certain conditions or have certain characteristics is to use a chemostat. Now what happens in a chemostat let us take a look. So this is your uh, sequential batch transfer we are taking from one batch reactor to another to another and this is your chemostat. So in chemostat this is your reactor, this special tube, it has a continuous air supply, you can oxygenate it if you want to enrich aerobic microbes or you can make it anaerobic by purging it with nitrogen. You have a fresh medium here, so this is your um, fresh inlet container and then this input media, it, it will have food, it will have microbes if you need to and will uh, have a continuous or near continuous or regular input of food. And uh, here you have a receptacle where you have a continuous output of your product. So continuous input of reactant, continuous output of product, this is your CSTR, it is also called CMFR or chemostat. Now which is better? Is sequential batch reactor better or is chemostat better? Well it depends on conditions. Sometimes for example, um, sequential batch reactor would be better because it gives more time for microbes to grow and we can actually isolate select microbes that are very resistant to arsenic. But sometimes for example, if you are looking at cellulose degradation, some of the degradation byproducts are toxic or inhibitory, inhib inhibitory for the uh, parents or parent for the in, uh, original cellulosic pr products. So the more we have degradation going on, we have a negative feedback and the degradation stops. So in that case, the sequential batch reactor will not be nice because after some time the microbial communities will not be able to degrade food because some of the daughter products are toxic or inhibitory. So microbes will die out eventually, so the batch reactor won't work. What would work in this case is chemostat because we are continuously removing the product, we are continuously removing daughter product. So we can uh, uh, control the chemostat flow in a way that the concentration of the do toxic daughter products or inhibitory daughter products remains below the threshold value. Alrighty. So this is very beautiful diagram that I want to highlight. In serial batch, uh, uh, sequential batch transfer method, this is how your substrate dynamics look like. Initially there is a lot of food and then the food is consumed by microbes, it drops and then there is an, when you transfer to new bottle, new batch reactor, there is another spike in the amount of food because you added fresh food and this goes on and goes on so forth. In CSTR or in chemostat, it looks very different. In chemostat, Initially you will have good amount of food because you are uh, adding fresh meal, but over time your f amount of substrate and amount of microbes will stabilize in your chemostat. Okay. So what to do once your enrichment of pure culture is obtained? 
what do you do now you have enriched either using sequential batch reactor or using chemostat well you need to understand what kind of microbes you have grown r strategist or k strategist so let's say on y axis we have the growth rate and on x axis we have the concentration of growth limiting substrate so when the growth limiting substrate is substrate is very high so it means there are no limitations the food is plenty there is more food than non um, there is more food than that is required by microbes so it has high food to microbe ratio in this case is the R strategist microbes they outcompete and they have a slightly different growth kinetics than microbes that um, make use of low food conditions, low sub limiting substrate conditions. So these are case strategies. So you need to understand what kind of microbes you have isolated. So if you go back here, notice here what kind of microbes will enrich and here what kind of microbes will enrich. Now obviously here we have microbes that uh, will outcompete when food is sufficient they will enrich so here we'll have our strategist and at the bottom here when there's a famine regime we'll have k strategist so now uh, once you have enriched you need to find out for example in case of sequentially batch uh, sequentially batch transfer method that where do you want to sample your uh, microbes from do you want our strategist or do you want k strategist if you want our strategist then sample it right away after you do your next fresh um, transfer if you want case strategies, then do it prior to the trans your plant transfer. Okay. Now the other question that arises whether when we are trying to enrich our microbes is what media to use. Do you use, um, yeah, if you are growing aerobic microbes, you need different kind of media. If you are growing anaerobic microbes, you need different kind of media. Now here are some tables that will tell you what kind of uh, incubation requires what kind of microbe. So if you are growing light phototrophic bacteria, Remember their main carbon sources, carbon dioxide because they are autotrophic, they use light. So if you are growing them in air, nitrogen, is ni uh, nitrogen gas will serve as nitrogen source. Nitrate might also serve as nitrogen source when you would have high temperature. So you need to supply them nitrogen gas or nitrate depending on the microbe you are enriching. Now if you are doing anoxic incubation of light phototrophic bacteria, now because it is anoxic, we do not want oxygen in there. So we use hydrogen, we use organic acids and we supply nitrogen not nitrate because the nitrate will uh, re increase the oxidation potential. So we use nitrogen as sole nitrogen source and you can isolate some kind of bacteria or you can also use H2 as a electron donor. Now if you want to do dark chemolithotrophic bacteria, their main carbon source would be uh, um, CO2. So, you should make sure that apart from carbon dioxide, there is no other source of carbon and you do not need light. So, you electron do you can add certain electron donors and electron acceptors according to what you are trying to uh, enrich. Similarly, here in dark chemo organotrophic bacteria and methanogens, you need to have a carbon donor, a special carbon source and organic compound. So, uh, depending on again what kind of microbe you are trying to enrich you need to add particular kind of electron donors and electron acceptors. Take an example, I want to enrich nitrifying bacteria. Now nitrifying bacteria are chemolithoautotrophs. So chemolithoautotrophs, the word auto suggests that they use carbon dioxide as carbon source. We do not need to add a prime, another source of carbon. So do not add any other source of carbon in the media, but make sure that there is plenty of carbon dioxide available. Now, because they are nitrifiers, the oxygen will be the electron acceptors and ammonia will be the electron donor. Okay? So, add ammonia and oxygen and um, make sure carbon dioxide is present and there is no other form of food available. So, basically you have to provide a medium that is rich in ammonium, dissolved oxygen because we need oxygen and bicarbonate for carbon dioxide source, but should not have other electron donors. Alrighty. Now, how, do, how and why do we isolate pure cultures? So, when we are enriching from microbial communities, environmental microbial communities, even after undergoing chemostat or sequential batch transfer method, we might come up with microbes that serve our purpose, for example, are arsenic tolerant or degrade cellulose, but, but it is uh, very likely that it is not a pure culture. It is likely there are multiple populations that are existing and it is a community instead. So, Earlier, there was a lot of emphasis in, in uh, even now there is some emphasis in isolating pure cultures and for good reason because I isolating pure cultures gave us insight into microbial activities that study of communities will not give us. Well, now that we have metagenomics, it is quite possible to understand population and community dynamics also, but there are still benefits from isolating pure culture. Let us look at it. If you want to link a specific microbe to a process. For example, I want to know, alrighty, 
I have a disease because I'm not feeling at ease. I have the symptoms. I want to know what disease, what pathogen it is. So now I want to link my physical phenomena, my physical experience with the microbe, with the pathogen. Now I want to identify it. In that case, it is very, very important to isolate the pure culture. So the first reason why you want to isolate the pure culture is to link a specific microbe to a process. You have to first isolate it in pure culture. So this is Robert Koch. He was the first one. What he observed was he noticed that um, when potato peels or when cut sliced potato are left out and open, eventually colonies grow on it. But he said that these are bacterial colonies and he assumed that each colony grows from one single bacterium cell. So in the potato slice, So let's say this is Koch's potato slice and he said that uh, he noticed after some time some kind of microbial growth on it and he hypothesized that from air or from elsewhere single microbes, single bacteria and these are invisible to eyes, they are very small, they fall on the potato slice and eventually they grow overnight or after some time and they form colonies which are visible to eyes. So he said that in this way it is possible for us to grow a pure culture uh, because each of these colonies, each of these colonies was sourced from single bacterium. And my dear students, if you work in microbiology lab or environmental microbiology lab and you do culturing, you can tell when a culture, when a colony is from multiple. Uh, from more than one bacteria because it will not be perfectly circular depending let's say E. coli a particular E. coli makes per perfectly circular colonies if you see colonies like this this shape colonies then you know that they have uh, there is mixture they are not all from the same microbe but because the coach was able to sort of prove uh, give evidence that each of these colonies came from a single bacteria if I take a swap of this colony and I pick this colony up and I do analysis, I have, I'm doing analysis of a pure culture. So let's say I did sequential batch transfer and now I've isolated microbes that are arsenic tolerant and I want to isolate their pure cultures. What I can do is I can grow them on potato slices. No, they're not necessarily grown potato slices, but something like a potato slice on which they can grow in a way that each colony comes from one particular microbe. And then I can pick them up, I can sequence them and you have learned about sequencing techniques in previous lectures. And once I have sequenced them, I will know how many different kinds of microbes I have, what are they and what are their characteristics. Okay, so eventually he decided he learned that not all microbes grow on potato slices so he practiced with different kinds of culture media and he tried gelatin because gelatin makes solidifies and it, it, it serves as a very good surface for microbial growth but eventually he agreed with auger and auger is still the primary um, culture media for isolating pure cultures Alrighty, and let's say this is what I have received so what uh, uh, this is let's say the mixed consortia that is actually arsenic tolerant let's say so I can pick up the individual uh, cells and then sequence them and get an idea of who they are now also I can look at this even before sequencing and see how many different kinds of colonies I have I can count the yellow colonies the small colonies the small red ones the small purple ones the blue ones the big red ones the big purple ones I can count them and I can get an idea of how many different kinds of microbes I have so even just looking at the colony can be used to classify microbes. Now came in Petri. Julius Richard Petri, a long time ago, what he discovered was that now or nearly a century ago, that it is quite he, he discovered this beautiful plate system, which is quite an ingenious idea. Basically, it is a smaller plate, a dish, and it has a lid that covers it quite fully. Uh, uh, throughout its height and when inverted it does not allow any intrusion of microbes through air into the plate. So once I have poured my auger here, my medium here, I have streaked it, added the microbes that I want to grow right, and isolate pure cultures from and then I invert it and I stack it like this then it is nearly impossible for microbes to enter into the petri dish. These petri dishes are still used and widely used, they are very very helpful a century later. In fact, I use them in my own laboratory 
and they are very very helpful because the design ingenious as it is it is very very applicable they are easily stacked easily sterilized and the larger dish prevents contamination ok so this is my petri dish I have put my uh, media here and this is the pink media I pick up my uh, consortia here and then I streak it now the way this I have shown you I have shown you this picture before so take the take a look again the way I start streaking is I streak in one direction from one corner in this way and then assuming that I have so I started from here I streak like this and then assuming that I have uh, spent most of the microbial um, consortia on my tip I make another streak here so I am basically trying to dilute trying to separate them away so that eventually I have less concentration of bacteria closer to each other and then I when I am done here streaking then I streak in this direction and then in this direction and then I slowly spread it across the plate. So the idea is to spread the microbes in a way that sequential dilution happens and finally we can have only one bacteria two bacteria separated with enough distance that individual independent colonies can grow. So here it is very hard to separate the colonies because there are so many microbes and instead of growing beautiful circular colonies they are growing streaks. But by the time I reach here most of the microbes on my uh, tip here this tip here are already spent so the few microbes that are still left here few bacteria that are still left on the tip will be separated by long distances and they can be easily picked up. So if you plate, plate start streaking from a side, streak like this and then when you think you have spread enough go in this direction then this and then this. What I have done in past is I would streak like this and then like this, this way, this way and then another way and when there is no more way left only then I will streak in middle <laughs> just to spread them out better. Okay. So these were Arabic cultures, how do I uh, isolate anaerobic pure cultures? Again this is um, uh, a column. Uh, column for isolating anaerobic pure cultures. Here I put my paraffin seal so that no air can enter and look here each of these are my colonies. So I can seal the atmospheric interaction so that no oxygen enters and the anaerobic conditions maintain. This is the more popular technique that I have uh, I am familiar with. We have an anaerobic jar you gas it with ni ultra pure nitrogen or mix of nitrogen and hydrogen so that uh, there is no oxygen you remove the oxygen from here and then you put your plates here the same petri dish the same old petri dish here these petri dishes are put here and then the microbes are allowed to grow here it works pretty well alrighty so I have grown my microbes now how do I enumerate them now enumeration techniques include cell counting so once my uh, microbes have grown like this I can count the cells I can count how many cells are there using microscopy so visually I can count this is still very much used when we are looking at heterotrophic uh, plate count so I want to know how many heterotrophic mi microorganisms are present it is also used for most when I am uh, another technique is most probable number so I can get an idea of what is the most probable number of coliforms or bacteria present in water or in a sample by counting it and I will go through most probable number a little bit in more in detail because this is very commonly used in environmental labs and then I can do plate count so basically I am growing them on my plates and I am counting how many colonies they make. The other is turbidity uh, I have some colleagues who have used who use this technique a lot to understand what phase uh, of the growth microbes are so if you go back to one of the early lectures where I am talking about microbial growth how they do undergo binary fission and how they start from lag phase they hit an exponential phase and then they go to a stationary phase and then they have a decay phase so you can and uh, in the diagram that I have shared you can see how turbidity of your media changes as the microbes shift from one phase to another. So turbidity is used a lot when we are um, growing microbes and trying to capture them at the exponential phase. I can also look at the cell components so I can analyze the total protein so if I have proteomic data I can say oh these are the proteins it is from this bacteria it is from this archaea or eukaryote. Similarly I can extract the total DNA analyze it so I can do metagenomics I can analyze the 16S rRNA gene or I can extract the total ribo uh, RNA. Now RNA will also give me information about what microbes are. I can also do lipids last class we talked about FAME so which was a lipid based analysis of microbes so earlier we would just uh, um, isolate the fatty acids from microbes and then uh, 
characterize them through chromatography techniques and then the signature of my fatty acid would tell me how many different microbes I have and now recently we also use ATP. Next is enzyme activity, I can actually look at protein activity. So, if a microbe is for example degrading some contaminant then I can okay this is this kind of microbe, this one does not so it is another kind of microbe. But now you can see that multiple different kinds of microbes can have same function. For example, sulfate reduction, there is not just one microbe that does sulfate reduction. So, if on basis of enzyme activity I might say well, the three strains that I have all of them are sulfate reducers, they have similar enzyme activities when it comes to sulfate reduction, but they might be very different from each other. I can also look at carbon dioxide production and oxygen consumption in case of aerobic microbes. I can also measure volatile suspended solids. Now, VSS or volatile suspended solids are used very commonly for getting an indirect count of my biomass in wastewater treatment plant. So, those of you here who are waiting can't wait enough for us to get into microbiology of wastewater treatment plant, understand that the VSS or MLVSS mixed liquor volatile suspended solids, both of them give you an idea of how many bacteria, how much biomass is present in your sludge or in your uh, water. Okay, so let us look at most probable number, I promised you we will go through this in a little bit more detail. So, in most probable number what I do is I have a particular broth that has a particular dye which changes color when the pH falls below a particular number. And I uh, take multiple tubes and in multiple tubes I put my broth and then I undergo serial dilution. So, serial dilution looks like this, this is my enrichment sample or natural sample, it could be water, it could be fecal matter, it could be river water, it could be my enrichment sample and what I will do is I will put uh, one tenth dilution you know. So, if this is 1 ml this will be 9 ml. So, I put it here and this is 1 by 10 the concentration of this and then after mixing this I will put 1 ml here in this 9 ml. It's all these are 9 ml to begin with and then after mixing this I will put 1 ml here, 1 ml here. So, eventually I will have 10 to power minus 1 concentration here, minus 2 here, 1000 here, 10,000 here, 1 lakh. Uh, fraction here and 1 millionth fraction here, 10 to a minus 6 fraction here. So, as I undergo dilution, I what I am actually doing is I am doing serial dilution of initial microbes that we begin with. The theory behind most probable number based enumeration is that dilution to extinction. So, finally, we will dilute the water, uh, the microbes so much that in one of the tubes, last tube, there will be no microbe left. Okay? So, here let us say I started with 100 microbes, here we had 1000, so we have 100 microbes here, 10, 1, 0. So, this is dilution to ex extinction. So, after 0, it will be just 0, 0 clean, so I will not see any growth. And the way to see growth is that turbidity might change or the one MPN technique used a lot for uh, measuring coliforms in water, the pH falls down and the color changes. So, either color or turbidity any optical measurement will give me an idea where the growth has happened, where the growth has not happened and using this I can get an idea of what the most probable number is. Now, most probable number as the name suggests is a probable number it does not give me an exact count. Alrighty dear students, uh, this is all for today. In the next class we will go ahead and we will explore more techniques in environmental microbiology. So, stay tuned for the next lecture and together they will um, hopefully comprise of the most common and useful techniques that microbiology has lent to us as environmental scientists, engineers and students. Thank you.